we'll go ahead and get started um, with this really exciting, awesome uh, panel of um, professionals here. Um, thank you, everybody who's uh, who's attending uh, our session um, for the Southern District uh, 2021 annual meeting. Uh, you are in the get out of my dreams, get into my multiple modes of transport uh, session right now, uh, featuring uh, multiple um, multiple panelists going through uh, some some multimodal projects, some really really exciting presentations. Glad to have you all on. Um, I'm Sean Coleman. I'm with Kinley Horn based out of Atlanta, Georgia. I'll be moderating today's session. Um, please feel free to use the chat feature to to ask some questions throughout, and we'll do questions at the end of every single uh, uh, presentation. And um, I also want to just give an extra thank you to our, our sponsors. You see the sponsor screen here rolling between our all of our various sponsors that have made this such a successful uh, virtual meeting. <clears throat> but I think we can go ahead and get started with our, our presentations. Um, Andy, if you would switch over to our first one. And again, this is the get out of my dreams, get into my multiple modes of transport. Um, you know, any of y'all Billy Ocean fans out there can recognize this one. And if any of y'all know me, you know, normally at Southern District, I'd be doing some karaoke right now, but unfortunately I'm not gonna be doing that for this. Uh, we're just gonna be listening to some awesome presentations. So up first, we have Dimitra Mihalaka from the Citadel, and she's gonna be sharing with us, uh, assessing the potential bike share networks and active transportation to improve urban, urban mobility, physical activity, and public health outcomes in South Carolina. Dr. Mihalaka is a associate professor at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Citadel and an associate director for the Center for Connected Multimodal Mobility, or C2M2. Dr. Mihalaka received her undergraduate, undergraduate diploma in civil engineering from the National Technical University of Athens, that's Athens, Greece, after which she entered into the transportation engineering graduate program at the University of Florida. She graduated with a master's of science in 2009 with a PhD in 2012. Her research is primarily focused on traffic operations, congestion pricing, traffic simulation, and engineering education. Dr. Mihalaka is a registered professional engineer in the state of South Carolina, and also recently in December, 2020, Graduated with a Master of Science in Project Management from the Citadel, so congratulations. And with that, I think we'll turn it over. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon and thank you, Son, for the nice introduction. So today I'm excited to be here, even though I would have rather preferred to be in person, <laughs> but we're, I'm glad we're engineers and we can adjust. Uh, so today we're going to talk about um, assessing potential of bike share networks and active transportation. Um, and uh, we have to, to see how we can improve urban mobility, physical activity and public health. And we focused in South Carolina. So it's a project um, that I'm very excited that I've been part of. And we I'm going to talk to you about uh, what is the project, how it came about, uh, what, who is working on it, and then the data and analytical methods we used, the bike share use patterns that we were able to make using our data, evaluation of the street network, that those um, will go hand in hand. Then what are the physical benefits if we have people riding bikes instead of using their vehicles? Some research takeaways in the end and the next steps for this uh, research. So the research team is quite big. So from the Citadel is myself, and then Dr. Davis, Dr. Brown, and Dr. Bornstein. Then we have Dr. Hudie from College of Charleston. Then we have Drs. Hon and Kaczynski from University of South Carolina, and then Dr. Watkins from Georgia Tech. The funding came from two sources. They're both uh, university transportation centers, one is the Center for Connected Multimodal Mobility that the head university is Clemson, and the center includes all the universities in South Carolina that have civil engineering programs. And the focus is how we can have a multimodal transportation through connectivity, data analysis, and automation. And the other center is the Stride Center, South Southeastern uh, Transportation Research Center for Innovation, Development, and Education, where the lead university is University of Florida. 
and they, um, the focus is how to mitigate congestion through emerging technologies and innovation. And you can see here on the map uh, all the universities that are part of that center. So when we were looking to, um, to work on a, a project, we saw that the bike share programs are getting quite popular in several cities across the United States and the micro mobility trips that include the conventional station based um, bike share uh, programs, then the scooters that in some cities are very, very popular. For example, I've been in Austin and um, there were scooters everywhere. And then we have all these electric um, bikes um, and scooters, uh, the dockless bike shares. And from 2017 to 2019, we saw a huge increase. So from 35 million, now we have, in 2019, we had 136 million shared micro mobility trips. And also there are very uh, many benefits, uh, health benefits connected to uh, use, doing things with like phys physical activity. So we said, okay, what if we analyze the bike share programs around South Carolina? So our focus initially uh, was the bike share in Charleston because it was, we are, most of us are located here. It was very easy to obtain the data because we came um, in a meeting with Gotza Group and they were uh, very nice and they gave us access to their data. So we could go online to their database where they collect all the data that they come in from the bike share and we could get um, access to them and download them and do the analysis. So in Charleston, they have about 30 stations and about 250 uh, bikes. And uh, uh, when they gave us um, access to the data, that was before the pand pandemic. Um, so we looked and we said, okay, what is a representative month that we can get the data and analyze? So at that time, we concluded that April uh, 2018 was a good month. So we were able to get the trip uh, GPX files that they include latitudes and longitudes for every trip, and those are logged every second. So for that month, uh, we had about 800,000 GPS uh, point locations that we used to create the bike routes. So for having all these data, we could connect them and see where people are riding and what routes they are taking. So here is a snapshot. So hopefully you will see my slides. So is, um, this one is a geocoded GPS locations from the bikes. So you see like the different dots on the map and using those, uh, here is a more close up, uh, we created the different routes. Now you see that some points and some uh, uh, routes are not on, on areas that the bike could go. So they, we needed to do some cleanup where the data and the routes, but in the end, we had a very good representation of where all those trips were going. So looking at the bike share uh, use patterns, uh, here we see an area that is uh, close to the Medical University of South Carolina Fitness Center. And you see how heavily that area is traveled by bikes because you see like the, the routes with the green lines. And here is another location in Charleston that we wanted to see because here there is a major uh, street with um, heavy vehicle traffic, that is the red lines. So we wanted to see how many uh, bike um, routes there are around uh, that area. Here is a very, very popular touristic place. So I don't know if you have been in Charleston, but if you have, you know, uh, probably the waterfront park. And if you are planning to visit, is a place to um, to go and either bike or walk and see. It's very very nice. And we also wanted to see how many bike trips there are around there. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but on the, all the way to the right, there are some um, bike routes that you see them going into water. So those are not by mistake. And there is a ferry that goes from downtown Charleston to Mount Pleasant. So um, those routes seem mean that some people got their bikes on the ferry uh, to cross to Mount Pleasant. So, okay, we had uh, like all the bike routes. So we wanted to aggregate them on the streets of the peninsula of um, Charleston. So you see here is the entire peninsula shown. 
So we uh, split those uh, for all the trips in five different categories using GIS, and we mapped, and you see with red, the heavily traveled streets, and then with orange, a little bit less, and then with green, the few um, routes. Then we wanted to also see and split the all users into locals, and into tourists to see if those patterns were different. And actually here looking the map, you see that they were quite different. So you see around MUSC, uh, we have a lot of local trips while uh, around downtown and that waterfront area, we have a lot of tourist trips uh, made. Uh, then we, uh, we wanted to see how many miles each trip uh, is. So we saw about 70% of the bike trips were less or equal to three miles. So you see, you see here that we um, graphed them based like one mile trips, two mile trip, three miles. And um, this is uh, something that uh, shows that there is high potential because we many often we talk about all these vehicle trips that are less than um, three miles and based on the national household travel survey about 46 percent of those vehicle trips are less or equal to three miles so here there is potential like if we can switch people like from the vehicle to the bike um, we can avoid a lot of congestion in downtown areas and we have health benefits associated with them so it's a good thing to see then we said okay so this is where people are riding on but what about how good or safe those streets are so we wanted to calculate this a uh, bike level of service for the different segments so we use the formula that was developed by spring consulting and uh, that formula includes uh, different aspects of the infrastructure and the traffic volume. So we include traffic volume, number of lanes, uh, speed limit, the effective lane width, so, and also if there is a bike lane dedicated to the bikes or if the bikes are sharing the lane with the vehicles. Then if you have a, a high percentage of heavy vehicles, like how many via heavy vehicles you have there, and the, the pavement surface condition. So if you use all this, um, you can calculate a score and based on that score, you can get your level of service. So if the score is low, less than or equal to 1.5, you got level of service A, then you go in increments of one, so level of service B, C, and then if you pass the 5.5, then you have level of service F. And that means that that road is best if not traveled by bikes. So is it there unsafe? Um, or the pavement conditions are not good, or there is too much traffic, or many heavy vehicles, high speeds. So we mapped um, the streets based on the level of service. So with a red, you see level of service E and F, which basically means best of be avoided by bikes. And then with green A and B, and then you see in between um, yellow and orange, the level of service C and D. So now we said, okay, now let's see how many bike route miles and how many bike counts are in those different level of service. So how many they're in level of service A, B, C, D. And we see the majority at level of, are at level of service B, which is a good thing, but there are still some that are happening in level of service D and few in level of service E, luckily nobody in level of service F. But we want to see if we can maybe inform the bikers like to not use those streets, or maybe if we inform the agencies to go and make improvements at those streets. Further, we wanted to see um, wh where are those streets in terms of like local streets or arterials, collectors, so we split that again, we see level of service B, um, the majority, and then we also split it into local users and tourists, because um, we wanted to see if there is some difference there, if people know and they're familiar with the network versus if they're not. Also, we run the streets by percent of bike miles uh, for all users, and then again for locals and tourists. And if you're not familiar with the area, it really 
is not very useful to see all these streets and okay the bike miles and the level of service but the point here is to show you that that analysis can be done and depending where you are and what are the results as i said maybe we put when the people go to check out the bike maybe you put an alert in their app that says avoid these streets or instead use alternative route through that street or you say to the dot or the city or the planner say oh maybe we need to go and make improvements in these streets because there are a lot of bike miles but the level of service is not good so if we look that in local and visitor we see that there are visitors that are going in worse segments so maybe because people don't know and they're not familiar with the network and here is something that we can do and protect um, those travelers and we could also identify these good segments that are high use but then also poor segments that also high use that yes go out and make some changes uh, then in addition to that analysis uh, we looked into the physical activity uh, benefits so for again as we had access to the gotcha group uh, database for this analysis instead of using just one month because here we don't need every single uh, gps point so we could use an entire year so we use the data from entire uh, 2018 and is a is a summary file that is csv and includes um, the right id the date the length of the trip the membership ID, so from that we can see if who is local and who is not local. The start and end times, so you can see the duration of the trip with that. The start and end hub, hub so where did they start, where did they finish, the right time duration and uh, what time of day people were riding. From that, having the total distance and the duration of the trip, we, we could calculate the speed. Now, having the speed, and we had the speed in miles per hour, we can use that speed to get a category in what is called the metabolic equivalent of task. So that is a measure of how much energy you spend when you are doing an activity. So if your activity is light, or moderate or vigorous, you have different uh, numbers associated with that. Then you take that number, you multiply it with the uh, duration of your trip, and you end up with what we call the met minutes. So if you see here, uh, the met minutes, as we said, is an indication of how much energy you spend and how for how long. So based on the national guidelines for each person is recommended that in a week, you spend about 500 to 1000 met minutes. And looking at our data that we had for that year, uh, 34,441 trips, we saw that the average met minute per trip was 161, which translates that if people in a week make three or four of such trips they meet the national recommended guidelines for energy expenditure so it's huge health benefit now when we go um, into the future that um, there are companies that they recommend to include electric assist bikes so since those are helping you out so you don't paddle all the time we'll have to make adjustments in that energy expenditure so we have a parallel research project going and calculating what is the expenditure if you use such type of bike because you still spend some energy but nearly as much as if you have the conventional uh, bike then we split so we did the same analysis for the local people and for the tourists and we saw that the locals are uh, riding um, less times and shorter duration so they're familiar with the network so probably they use the, they know where exactly the stations are so they take the bike they go somewhere close park the bike and maybe they use it again later versus the tourists that they will go for sightseeing so they go around with a bicycle and they have a longer uh, duration so 
higher metamin, so more exercise out of it. Um, major um, research uh, takeaways, uh, as uh, also mentioning during the presentation, one thing is that there is high potential in replacing those very short vehicle trips with bicycles. Um, and especially in, in locations that is good weather, like in Charleston, like most of the year, um, you can really bike unless it's raining. Um, there is another uh, thing that we see here that there is some uh, energy expenditure, which is huge health benefits. So it's for the well being for the community. So that's the second takeaway. Then um, is that we can find with this analysis any locations in the network that maybe they are not as good or as safe for people to ride. So we can either inform the travelers or we can go and make improvements up. And then um, we can, like, if we use all this, we can really improve the congestion in the city or the health outcomes. So there is um, much, much benefit out of it. And uh, we talk, can talk with the, the, the agencies. And as I said, we can improve uh, the network. Now for the future, so this project is almost done. Um, we are uh, also getting data from Columbia. So we are talking about the data agreement with the blue bikes in Columbia. So we do the similar analysis. And uh, in addition to that, we want to include more cities so that's another uh, future task that we're working on in getting data from the Gotza group in different cities that they have um, such um, networks. And we want to see how those benefits are changing if you have the scooters in play, if you have the electric um, assist bikes in place and compare uh, with those. So here um, is the end of my presentation. So uh, here is our contact information. The first is mine, and then I included all the teams. So if you have, you can ask questions now, but also if you have questions uh, later in the future, uh, you can contact us at any time. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. That was that was wonderful. Um, we do have a few questions that have come in. So awesome. Um, one question is: Is there any correlation between? the travel patterns of shared and non-shared bikes? Was that um, researched at all? No, we looked, um, uh, honestly, we just looked the shared bikes because um, if it's not shared, we don't have a way to track those bicycles. So these ones that you uh, actually go and you check them out from the station, we could get every second where the bike is. So we did analysis only with those. We didn't look any non a shared bike system. Okay, great. Um, another question. I'm sure this would be a question that a lot of folks get in this in this time. Any impacts related to COVID? Anything? Have, have, have there been any data looked at in terms of, um, you know, what the impacts have been on the trips? Yeah. So there there is a big impact. So in the start there weren't uh, that this many trips as it was in the past. But then also we saw an increase in the trips later on because people prefer to do some physical activity outside uh, instead of staying home because it was a safe activity to do. But um, now that we were looking the new set of data to also compare with the e-bikes, we saw that those weren't very representative. So there were fluctuations due to the pandemic. Uh, so we decided to not select data uh, during uh, the pandemic unless we want to do research later on just looking the impacts during COVID. Right, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I mean, you couldn't buy a bike uh, during the beginning of COVID because everybody was purchasing them because people wanted to get outside. It was the only safe activity was to get outside and you know, bike yes, with your family or bike, bike around the city. Yeah, in the start we saw also drop because there weren't people like all these tourists that we had they weren't allowed people weren't traveling so they weren't allowed to come but then later on as the travel was permitted again we saw a fee like increase mm -hmm. in the travel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right and uh one more question related to crash data what was was crash data utilized uh in the level service analysis at all no but we do have the crash data 
And that was a different thing that we, were, we wanted to look at um, to see which segments there were actually crashes happening to, to also map those and let the, the agencies know. Um, so they weren't used in the bike level of service calculation, but we do have the data and we're looking at them. Okay, great. Well, I think that's all we have by way of, of questions. Um, really fascinating presentation, I especially, I mean, I, I actually had a question written down, but then you answered it related to, you know, is the level of service D routes related to more visitors that don't know the system? But it, it sounds like that that is the case. And, and I really like some of the ideas of, you know, they probably are just going from point A to point B, the, the, the shortest route, but some ideas of letting them know how to, how to navigate around that. I think that's really, really cool research. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So we're working with the Gogotza group that has the system. So we were we had discussed putting something in the app, and we talk also with the different committees here that they are looking at the infrastructure to make they make some improvements uh, in those like poor segments. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mekalaga. I know that you have uh, some other things to attend to, but thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. So if uh, there are more questions uh, that you guys in, can email me because I have to drop off and uh, go to a different session. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we will go ahead and switch to the next presenter, Andy, if you could, if you could switch uh, presenters. And I also believe at the end of this, we'll, we'll post um, all the presenters email in the chat box, just so you have another place to to email folk, basically to kind of replicate that, uh, hey, if you're at a conference and and that that sweet spot of in between sessions and the and the, and the presentations are over and you're able to go up and talk to the um, the presenters, to ask them that burning question that you had, um, you know, can't quite replicate that in this environment, but uh, be sure to reach out to the presenters if there's anything you really want to want to find out about. So, all right, it looks like we have our next presentation queued up which is from uh, Thomas Ruff, uh, and it's on Chesterfield County Sidewalk Inventory and, and Planning Tool. And so Thomas is a project manager for the Timmins Group Traffic Planning and Analysis Group with nearly a decade of experience in tra traffic engineering, transportation planning, and multimodal infrastructure design. He has worked with localities and state DOTs to evaluate existing safety concerns, develop concepts that incorporate alternative modes of transportation, plan effective countermeasure designs, determine innovative in improvement strategies, and participate in community outreach for successful project implementation. Thomas earned his Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Virginia. Thomas also holds a master's degree in public policy from George Mason University and has experience analyzing local and regional economic development and transportation policies. Thomas served as the overall project manager for this uh, project that he's about to present on. And uh, Thomas, if you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Awesome, thanks for the introduction, Sean. Um, really excited to be here and be able to give this presentation uh, with Southern District and, uh, and show off a fun tool that we were able to work on with Chesterfield County. Um, for folks that may or may not know, uh, Chesterfield County is, is uh, the largest county just outside of the city of Richmond uh, in Virginia. And so we've had a long relationship with them from an engineering standpoint um, for 30 plus years. Uh, but over, uh, as, as our GIS technology practice ha has grown, we've been able to further incorporate uh, engineering and GIS technology and mapping all into one. So this really came to fruition while working with Chesterfield County. So the, the starting point that uh, came out was, uh, was that, the county was asked by their board of supervisors, the, tr the transportation department, um, if we had a million dollars, which pedestrian facility project would we choose? And they were given this opportunity about two years ago, the county had some additional funding and they wanted to focus on building sidewalk projects that were standalone um, or shared use pass projects. And they weren't, uh, they didn't wanna be projects that were incorporated with other uh, widening or operational safety projects, wanting to be standalone pedestrian projects. And the county has a laundry list of those operational and safety projects, but didn't really have 
specifically pedestrian projects. And so with that, they, they kind of came to us and said, all right, well, we'll we're going to get this money again in fiscal year 2020. Unfortunately, with COVID, that was pushed to 2021, but they wanted to have a prioritized list that helped them pick projects as they were going forward. Um, and we were all aware of that competitive nature and the limited resources for funding. So how can we help them prioritize their projects? So the, the county is, was well aware and they, you know, they, they, the Chesterfield County Transportation Department worked closely with their board of supervisors for the understanding of, of why they wanted to have a fully connected sidewalk network. Um, I, I know many of us uh, on this, this call and, and in, in our careers, we know the importance of, of bikes and sidewalk networks, um, but this project, we wanted to lay that out and, and discuss how, um, what the county would get out of this. And so you get improved safety, right? Creating those separated uh, pedestrian spaces. You're improving opportunities by allowing uh, lower income populations to access transit stops, uh, access those uh, commercial areas, access different uh, county and government functions. Um, you encourage economic and social interaction, connecting residential and commercial properties. And, uh, and you, you gain that increased sense of community by tying everything together rather than being in individual bu bubbles separated by a roadway. So to help the county out, we came up, we, we came up with this, this three-point plan. This is how I'll talk through the next portions of the project. Um, the first step, of, as always, if you're going to build something new or if you want to plan something new, you got to know where it is today, what, what you have on the ground. And so a big part of the start of the project was mapping existing sidewalk data for all the major routes um, in the county. And I, I will note here that um, most of our work and what we were looking for in prioritizing was solely on major thoroughfares and connecting roads, not so much residential streets that were you know, under 25 miles an hour, less than a thousand trips a day, you know, those those were anticipated to either somewhat decent sidewalk or you'd feel safe walking there, but really the major connecting. Um, so from that point, we were able to create a master plan for the entire county, um, the ideal layout of a sidewalk for, for everywhere in the county. And then third, using demographics and a GIS proximity analysis, we were able to prioritize those segments. So I'll get into each one of these buckets. Um, so uh, the very first step again was a, a looking through what GIS data the county had. So the last update they had done to their sidewalk network was about five years ago. Um, it had been sporadically updated. And so we took the information provided by the county um, and used Google o imagery overlays to inventory new sidewalks. Um, we also were able to utilize the VDOT roadway surface condition inventory, which is a uh, VDOT uses uh, vans with wide angle lenses that allow them to see right of way to right of way. So you pick up what the road looks like, you know, it's conditioned, but you can also pick up, you know, how many lanes are there. And if, if there is sidewalk, guardrail, kind of a lot of different roadway uh, inventory items. And so that really helped in bumping up the number of sidewalks. So today, uh, the Chesterfield County has approximately 270 miles of sidewalk. So I've got a, a, an image here of what that existing sidewalk network looks like. Um, and you can see uh, the green there represents the existing, uh, the, the orange or kind of the, the, the highlighter orange is a, uh, the proposed, which is currently funded by, by projects that are in the pipeline in the county. Um, but what you see is what you would see in a, a typical, uh, you know, suburban county. So the city of Richmond is in the northeast corner. And so you can see that, that as you move away from there, you've got pockets of residential. Um, but in, in reality, there's really no connected uh, nature of the sidewalks in this area. Once we had that in hand, we were then, we said, okay, let's do a, a missing link analysis. Let's build out the county network. So this image here um, 
and I've got I've got some pieces of this that I'll show later in a in a web application that's a little cleaner than PowerPoint can do. But um, what you'll see here is the idealized county network, right? So we went in and using the major routes and connected all of those existing sidewalks, but also places that had nothing, and said if you had the ability, this is the sidewalk network you would want because you could get from anywhere in the county to anywhere else. And so there's a little over 2,000 segments in green here. So again, that's great. You know, we've come up with where the sidewalks should be if you had every dollar in the world to build it. Um, but that still doesn't answer that question of which one do we pick? Which one do you do first? Do you take one that is in, you know, closer to the city of Richmond or do you take something that's uh, further out towards uh, more of the rural portions of the county? And so that's where we had to spend a little bit of time creating a pedestrian priority model with Chesterfield County and help them come up with something that would uh, allow us to figure out which sidewalks should go first. Um, so there's three basic components to this. Uh, pedestrian generators, so if that is where are there most likely to be a pedestrian or, or, or need for pedestrian facilities. And this was accomplished using demographics, which I'll get into in a second. Um, the second was pedestrian attractors. So where are places that pedestrians would want to go uh, within the county? And then third, pedestrian detractors. So things within the roadway infrastructure uh, that might cause uh, an issue for uh, an issue for having pedestrian man maneuverability. So the demographic model, as I mentioned, um, was created, and this is something the county was focused on, was focused on uh, lower income, which we made up of two points of this, which is the median household income and low to moderate income indexes. And uh, these first four are all from the 20, uh, the updates in the 2018 census data or 2019 census data. Um, we're hoping to update for 2020 sometime here in the future. Um, we also used American Community Survey data, the ACS for those uh, numbers five through eight. So it was a combination of low income, a combination of population, high population density, and um, in the ACS there, you see the number of vehicles that were owned was one or zero, um, and that was to simulate locations that we know people are self-reporting that they only have access to one vehicle in a family household um, and then the acs for workers that walk bike and use transit to reach their their working destination so the outcome of that demographic model um, showed something somewhat similar to what we might have expected knowing the area uh, of the city of richmond so and the surroundings so city of richmond again is in this northeast uh, corner of the map and the, the the county border stretches a, a long distance and uh if you follow down this is uh the i-95 corridor uh you end up in petersburg virginia which is the south east corner of the map and of the county and so there is a population density is much higher along that 95 corridor um, and along the portions of the county that are closer uh, in addition, so when the population is more dense, you're you're bound to have a, a generally a slightly lower income with the multifamily housing that exists in a lot of this area, and uh, the, and then also if you live in the further areas of the county, so if you're out uh, on the far west end of the county, your ability to walk or bike or use transit is is almost non-existent because of the distance of travel that you would need to get to the pop the working centers. Um, as well, there is uh, limited to no transit beyond the, the bordering connection with the city of Richmond. Um, so this kind of matched some of the goals. But again, we've got a piece of the puzzle because these are all census block groups and that's great information. But we didn't want to go back to the county and say, OK, build everything within this block group or build everything within this one. Um, we need to figure out again what's what's the next priority level. Um, so the, the next piece in that pedestrian priority model is pedestrian attractors and pedestrian detractors. Um, based on conversations with the county um, for these attractors is 
would a you know what's the what's the distance their their county community surveys show that people will walk and in general that was about a half mile uh that someone was willing to walk to participate whether you know generally that that meant that there was uh some type of facility available but this was what we wanted to generalize to some so we we, we had looked at doing a quarter mile um we had looked at doing further but we felt the half mile was in line with, with the community survey and the, again the county the scoring methodology here was was again something we went through with the county so transit stops were their most important um and and then community centers and then neighborhood retail and, and schools but some a lot of these pieces they were they were parts that they weren't as concerned with um and they felt that they wanted to focus in on on locations that have high density and high you know connection to to commercial areas and so we had to break it apart to show community retail uh less than 10 within that half mile and more than 10 because some locations got extremely overweighted if you were in an area with a strip mall or something that had 20 or 30 businesses in a very close proximity um, so that gives you one portion of the scoring and then the second portion of the scoring was actual detractors so where are pedestrian crashes occurring and we took each of those segments and buffered the crash location to the segments that we created those 2000 segments and said okay if, it ha if there was crashes that occurred per year over the previous uh, five years that will help wait to say this location likely needs a sidewalk um, and the same thing is true for these the average daily the, the the volume of trips on a roadway and then the speed of the trips so any of those that was a high speed high volume location generally also had high pedestrian crashes because of the, the amount of mobility there and those locations were weighted to the top of the list so um through that we, we created a scoring uh, model and created an rgis online agol database for the county and i'm going to kick out now um, just to show some of that um, and i'll let sean tell me if he can't see anything but uh, i think we should be good so we've created a story map okay. um, i want to just kind of walk through a couple items just to see what 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 you get to give a little better visual so this is that existing fragmented network we did a little bit of cleaning up and adding sidewalk pieces in and then we were able to create a network that built upon that so that that's kind of the step one and, and that gives you those pieces um and so the the next piece was these businesses so we actually were able to and i can zoom in here and actually say these were these were business points within the county and you we could say okay you know something at uh, a specific location um you know we could we could you could we could have waited for types of businesses or anything like that the county wasn't as interested in, in waiting for that um but that was something we we could have done and discussed um so there's county businesses there's the points of interest. So we were able to, again, this is part of that proximity analysis. And lastly, those pedestrian crashes were part of that, um, that analysis. So the final product that we delivered to the county, you know, was this database of information um, that they can use interactively. And it's a public facing database, or it will be public facing. It is currently being finally tested, but, uh, all of these segments that you'll see the county can click on a one it will give the overall rank which district it's in what type of sidewalk or because we we differentiated between just a standard sidewalk behind ditch was their curb and gutter um the cost and the scoring and the county is able then to pick the top locations within a specific district um, and that was more because you can't you know as many of you have worked for localities you can't say okay we're going to do all of our improvements in one district because the supervisor from another one will give you a slap on the wrist um and so the you know that that was part of there and you could we could sh shift this by the budget uh the, the the cost the ranking the types of projects you could build and so this final product this map function was something we could 
easily deliver to the county and they can share with the public and that allows the public to uh you know saves a little bit on question right if you live in a neighborhood or in an area and you say i really have wanted sidewalk and i'm going to email the county every day until i get get the answer that i want um they're going to say you know they're going to say oh sorry we'll get to you again we'll um, this is just another piece of data to show the public that look we, we've we've put a lot of data behind this we really do believe um that you can you know you're on the list or, or maybe you're not on the list and this is why you know you, you maybe you didn't have um a large maybe there weren't any crashes maybe you know the speeds and the volumes and and the, the need for a sidewalk isn't that great but you just really want one and you can see where you are on that list um and uh, so uh, I will jump back in here and uh, and show off just a couple final pieces of of what we did for the county. Um, we also created uh, what we call cut sheets, which essentially grabbed out of that GIS map, put it onto a 11 by 17 piece of paper that could be handed off to a project manager, to a board of supervisors member, uh, to a funding agency, and say, okay. This is why we want to build this sidewalk. Here's a rough approximate cost, um, you know, the location that it's at, why it scored so well in the demographics rankings, um, how many businesses are there, schools, uh, transit locations, um, and the speeds and volumes. So you kind of get a whole piece of information that a county, a locality, the county could use to help get funding for their project. So uh, as I'm wrapping up here, you know, the project results, we, 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 we mapped out the existing 265 miles of existing sidewalk. Uh, we then built a master plan around that, which idealized the, the sidewalk network and created 2,000 sidewalk projects. Uh, using demographics and proximity analysis, we were able to rank those projects and then give the county the top recommendations for sidewalk by type magisterial district and a few other categories so that they could use it um, as they see fit. And, um, you know, just as this latest year of funding has come through, again, like I said, the county has been able to move forward. Uh, they've got, they've now got a couple million dollars, again, in sidewalk funding for specific sidewalk projects. And, you know, the tool, the county is hoping to use the tool to use data to assist and inform their funding goals on how to build out the network. It presents the opportunities to integrate with their other planning efforts for other projects going on for their bikeways and trails plan um, and how to align different routes. And they have been using it to integrate into planning efforts for special and small area plans to help those rezonings and special use permits and things like that to get um, to make sure that those projects are incorporating sidewalks that will meet the countywide sidewalk uh, goals. So with that, um, I don't know if I want to leave my face up the whole time, but that is uh, my, my final slide. So I'm happy for any questions. Um, I know there's a lot of data that I just threw out there and I'm happy to show anything else off uh, as needed. All right. Thank you, Thomas Scott. That, that, that website was pretty slick. <laughs> um, really, really, really awesome. Um, question came in in terms of, and you may have mentioned this, but how exactly were the links or the limits of the links determined? Sure. So, and I'll, um, if I'm since I'm still sharing, I'll uh, I'll jump out and and kind of go. So, when we were creating the the links, so that's that's the uh, that's the the engineering side, I guess, that came in is that we were as we were, this one's probably the easiest one to see it. So as we were picking these locations, um, you know, we made logical decisions on what, you know, we've worked with the county for a number or so. In the closer in, you know, these pro these projects are um, smaller, right? They, they occur at lo logical termini within, so they occur between uh, either existing sidewalks or they occur between major routes something that would make a logical term and I sense. So from that standpoint, we originally started with just a kind of a shotgun, which is, hey, here's all the routes that the county wants to see. Let's map that all out. 
And then we went back and said, let's cut these in logical locations. Um, so yeah, once we get further out into the county, now these locations scored poorly, right? But they are also very long. Um, and so we had those discussions of that will likely get broken up in the future. But at the same time, the county was, was aware that for a rural length of a side, so this one is, gosh, uh, probably a couple thousand, I'm trying to find my little, um, my length piece. Yeah, so, you know, that's 14,000 feet. So you're talking three miles, um, right? Like a sidewalk project probably wouldn't, wouldn't extend that far, but the county understood that by the time this project, which is ranked number 1700 uh, in the 1700s, by the time that project gets built, there might be other connections. Someone might say, develop this piece of land here. And so they build this section, um, you know, and this connects to a different county, but the hope was to at least give something that could be scored. And so the cost of a project didn't really play a big part in the scoring and we wanted to keep it that way. So. Yeah, that was actually gonna be my follow-up question was it was the cost factored in and all into the scoring, but that makes sense to not factor it in, but have the ability right. to filter it by cost, right? Exactly, we, we can filter it by cost, but yeah, the, their, their hope was to, um, you know, have something that was focused more on, yeah, yeah, that demographics in the need and then, the, you know, the funding would, uh, would would come later on. Okay, cool. All right, we have a question related to, I, th I think the graphic you had earlier was pretty stark that showed that the, the lack of connectivity, you know, just kind of different pockets of the county. Were, does the county have any sort of greenway or bikeway facilities and were those looked at at all? Yes, so the county does have uh, a few bikeway facilities and those were, um, those were added in during the uh, inside of these. So some of these actually are, so the county did come up with, um, I don't know, I had a, a, a backup slide, so I might still have it, but they, they did have a, a bikeways and trails plan. Um, and so this, this project, the hope is that the, that combined is there will be some overlap. So some of these are overlapping with locations that have recommendations for bikeways and the county wanted it was happy to have that overlap because they understood that when the time came to pick that um, they they could kind of work with their in their planning department and everyone to make sure that would happen um, we we had talked about adding that in as a piece as its own like actually breaking it up instead of so we do have pieces in here for sidewalk and shared use paths but anything that was strictly bike only, we we left out um, just just because there was um, a little hesitancy from them to focus on a bike only project. Okay, great. And um, I actually have a question related to so the scoring uh, for the for the generators. I was actually a little surprised that um, like elementary schools were or a three instead of a, a four or five, just given, you know, safe across the school and all that stuff. Was, was, was there any more insight into the county? I mean, obviously it makes sense, transit stops and all of that, but I, I just, I would have thought that the county would have wanted to prioritize schools a little a little bit more, but was there any insight into into that? Sure, um, so we, we had originally had that discussion of, of, of bumping uh, at least elementary schools to a higher uh, node and they, they were they actually the county actually has done a uh, a good job over the years of, of providing quite a bit of sidewalk um in around their elementary schools and proffering that as part of the development of, of elementary schools and so the the connectivity to the ne the neighborhoods um for most of the schools is, pr is is pretty good um and they what they didn't want is to get into uh, uh, at this time was was doing a lot of sidewalk projects in re strictly residential only neighborhoods um, and, and tried to prioritize more the major routes and the connecting roads um, to get residential to commercial and transit. So that's why they we came back and, and, and really beefed up those those bus stops, community centers and the retail. 
um, that, that, that their priority was more focused to there. And they've also gotten quite a bit of funding for Safe Routes to School and different other funding sources to, to have fairly good connectivity with the schools. Okay, cool. Actually, one final question came in. Is the, is the planning tool available on the Chesterfield website? Is it, is it public facing? So in today, as of today, it is not, it is not available. Um, we, are, we have been doing a few uh, final pieces of development and tweaking, um, but there is a publicly available, and I'll, I think these, this information is gonna go, I know this name is terrible, so I blame, I blame our GIS team, but I love them, so I can't blame them too much, but um, this I know it, it will be going up with the, the um, uh, I guess the, when the presentation goes online, this is the public available story map, which gives out a lot of that information. Um, you know, it's meant to show off. That was where I was showing some of my uh, information. But yes, there will be a public version, um, hopefully sometime this month. Um, you know, they've been using it for the past six months, but they've wanted to get their hands dirty before before letting it out um, publicly to make sure there wasn't anything that needed to be tweaked. Okay, great, and I just put that link, I, th I think I got it right, I just put that link on the chat feature, so uh, okay, yeah. wanna, wanna check that out. But um, but yeah, like like you said, Thomas, these uh, presentations will be available, um, should be an e-blast about in the next couple of days, um, if anybody else wants to, wants to check that out, so. I think that's all by way of questions that we have. Thank you so much. Very, very cool. Very interesting stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Absolutely. All right. I think we will move towards the the, the last presentation, Andy, if you could uh, start getting that one geared up. So uh, last we have Bastian Schroeder and Shannon Warkall for uh, Kittleson. That's going to talk about 20 questions for pedestrian and bicyclist safety at intersections, uh, an overview of NCHRP report 948. And so uh, Bastian is a principal engineer with Kittleson in Wilmington, North Carolina, specializing in multimodal safety design and operations, and was the lead investigator for NCHRP 07-25 on pedestrian and bicycle safety at alternative intersections and interchanges. Shannon is a senior engineer for Kittleson based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who works with local, state, and federal clients to develop solutions in safety and operations for all modes at intersections and interchange, with a special focus on alternative and innovative designs. Now, I also did a little bit of LinkedIn snooping because I know everybody likes to know where people went, went to school. Looks like both Bastion and Shannon have uh, NC State in, in their background. Bastion, I guess you you went there all the way through PhD. Wow, that's something else yeah and shannon you you got your master's but it looks like you got your bachelor's at, at notre dame oh shannon we can't hear you yeah i moved down to north carolina after my bachelor's and uh, met bastion we both worked at nc state as well for a few years before switching to awesome. Kelsey. well the people that know me well may not even know this but even though i'm a georgia tech guy with the rambler wreck behind me i'm also a secret notre dame fan so go irish um <laughs> But I'm not an NC State fan. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'll take Notre Dame over NC State any day. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, nah, it's, it's, it's always fun ACC stuff. So anyway, um, well, yeah, really excited to have you all present. And I think you have everything good to go on your end. So why don't you all take it away? Great. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Uh, lo lots of time at, at NC State. Um, and so uh, you know, look, look back very fondly at the time there. Uh, so welcome virtually to Wilmington. Uh, so I'm actually in Wilmington. Would have really liked to welcome everybody here uh, in person for the Southern District meeting. But so this this shot of our river walk is kind of the closest that you'll get. Uh, but then hopefully in 2024, we'll see everybody here in person. Um, so um, I wanted to start off this presentation with, with a couple of really important notes. As one, if you were paying attention to Sean's introduction, we, we made a, a title change between what the project is called and this report is called. And I think that title change is really important to emphasize. And it really changed in two ways. One is it's a guide for pedestrian and bicyclist safety as opposed to bicycle safety. It's just a good reminder for us to really talk about the human element um, uh, in transportation here, uh, not the metal or aluminum object, object uh, but the, the person on the bicycle. Um, and also that it's alternative and other intersections and interchanges 
because really early on in, in one of our early panel meetings, we got the feedback that if you're developing a method that only works for the alternative designs, the R cuts, the beta U turns, the DDI, it's useless because we can't compare to anything. And so really we structured this method early on to work for really all intersection types, even though the project started out looking at the alternative design. Uh, so this report is available now. Uh, you can just Google it, NCHFP report 948. Uh, and what we're presenting on today is really the heart of the guide. It's the 20 flag assessment method, but it's really just a small part of it. And I really encourage you to take a look um, at really a lot more that's, that's in the guide. Uh, guide. Uh, lots of really great information about, about uh, intersection design. Um, lastly, I want you to take a look at this intersection um, and really begin to think and form your own opinion on, you know, is this safe for pedestrians and cyclists? Uh, there's crosswalks here, there's channelized lanes, there's on-street bike lanes, there's lots of pretty paint. Um, so, you know, at first glance, maybe this is an intersection that has all the check marks. Um, and so really, this is an approach that goes beyond the check marks. And we'll come back to this intersection um, at, uh, later in the presentation to really show you how you can look at a design like this and, and assess it a little bit more critically and to maybe say, well, even though we have some colored paint uh, for pedestrians, maybe there are still some things we could do better. So start forming your own opinions and then curious if you come up with the same solutions that we do. Um, so to start off with, the, the design process really is a, is a performance-based process. So many of you are likely familiar with uh, performance-based design, performance-based practical design. Uh, the roundabout guide has a big emphasis on this. Here's a graphic from, from NCHRP report 785. Uh, and that really means no design is perfect from day one. It requires iteration because you have competing design objectives. And a lot of times the, the design outcomes um, are, are, are tugging and pulling in different directions. And a, and a common one at a roundabout is the, you know, for example, the entry speed. Um, so you want speed control to get into a roundabout, uh, enhance the safety, you want the vehicle speeds to be slow. Uh, and pulling in the other, other directions, design vehicle. So you're running your auto turn, you get a sense of what's your design vehicle in your truck. And then we use things like a truck apron to, to come up with the best of both worlds. Control the speeds for passenger cars while still allowing trucks to so think of that same considerations and throw in the pedestrians and bicyclists and really taking these 20 questions that we've come up with and adding them to the things as you're evaluating your design, whether that's roundabout or a DDI or an R-cut or just a standard you know, signalized intersection. Um, think of these 20 questions as other ways to evaluate the design uh, and assess whether or not they work for pedestrians and cyclists. And if they don't, if you have flags that, that, that are red flags, you'll see that terminology pop up, then that doesn't mean it's a fatal flaw. It just means we might have to uh, either change the design, retrofit it, use some sort of treatment or countermeasure, but it's, it's really intended to be a, a quantitative process at, at evaluating the design. Um, and so here's the 20 questions. Um, again, you'll have the slides. These are all described in the report. Uh, we won't have time in this presentation to go through every single one, uh, but you see some of these, you know, uh, relate to pedestrians, some relate to cyclists, some relate to both, um, and they're really, you know, intended to be relatively quick checks uh, that you go through. Um, and for each of these, uh, we have, uh, so if there's soccer fans in the audience, uh, we, we talk about yellow flags and red flags. Um, and so for each of those, Think of them being evaluated that a yellow flag is a design element that may negatively impact the user comfort, right? So it, it adds to the stress level. Um, so that could be things like the, you know, the odd center walkway in the DDI, for example, or a narrow walking environment or cycling, you know, na narrow walking environment, but still that's, that's buffer separated. Uh, it might be uncomfortable, but it's not necessarily unsafe. Uh, the red flag are the ones that are safety concerns. Uh, so having an on-street bike lane on a 45 mile per hour roadway, and then expecting cyclists to change lanes across traffic that's moving at 55 miles an hour to get into a left turn pocket is frankly just not a safe movement. Um, and so think of these yellow and red flags. And so the way they're being applied is um, through the, the different movement. So on the left for cyclists, we're treating cyclists as a vehicle. Uh, so assuming on-street cyclists, and so we're looking at the, the right turns, the throughs, the left turns. And then for pedestrians, we're really looking at the quadrant connection. 
Um, and so you can think of those, and we actually developed some, some worksheets uh, that we'll make available um, for the pedestrian flags and the bicycle flags. See, there's 20 flags total, but not all apply. And the idea is you go through the assessment for the pedestrians, the west, east, north, and south crossing. You go through and evaluate these and either uh, mark them as yellow or red flags. And then for the cyclists, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, because you have the, the the 12 different movements that a cyclist might perform. Uh, but as you'll see going through it, a lot of times we set up our intersections to be relatively symmetrical. Um, and so for example, if all the approaches are 45 miles an hour with the same corner radius, then generally the same flag applies all the way across. So you can get through this relatively quickly. Um, certainly order of magnitude, you know, an hour or less per intersection after you are welcome uh, are comfortable with the method, you should be able to make it. Um, in distinguishing between the yellow and red flags, the guide does include uh, quantitative thresholds. So it gives you, you know, at speeds below X, uh, it's a yellow flag, above X, it's a red flag. So you don't have to make all the decisions on your own. Uh, there's some quantitative thresholds that uh, really were urged by the panel to develop and that we put into it. Uh, so let me give you just two flavors, two examples of what these flags are. The first one is for a pedestrian uh, called motor vehicle right turn. Uh, and this is really any time at an intersection you have a right turn where there's really two conflict points for pedestrians. They're shown here as dots. Um, and so they generally apply the, the upstream crossing. See my cursor here. Uh, this conflict generally applies whenever um, pedestrians have the walk indication north south. So this is typically a right turn on red conflict. And the downstream is typically a right turn on green conflict whenever the vehicles have a green ball and the um, and the pedestrians in the east-west direction have a current walking. Um, and so looking at those and then basically saying, well, is this safe or unsafe? It really becomes a question, to, a function of two things. Uh, what's the vehicle speed and what's the vehicle volume? We'll give you thresholds for that. Uh, so this is an, an image of a median U-turn, if you might have recognized it. Um, but the same design flag applies at all conventional intersections. So, so the bottom left is the intersection. I think this one is in Pittsburgh, um, you know, where you see it's kind of a, a one-way street on one direction. You see some bike turn boxes. And, and, you know, you see conflicts with the right turns. You see a radius here that is a little bit wider as opposed to the radius here that's really tight at the one-way street. Um, and so the, the, you know, the corners are not all treated the same. And so the experience for pedestrians would be very different. Uh, another example on the right is out of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, so this is channelized right turns that were actually put in for bicycle safety, um, but they were now retrofitted with uh, a race crosswalk in three of the corners to have speed control for vehicles. And so this is an example of applying a countermeasure uh, to really overcome some of the, the safety concerns. Uh, if, so if it's a high vehicle speed because of the channelized lane with an acceleration lane, you can um, uh, retrofit that with, with a with speed table or race crosswalk. Uh, another example is, is a multi-lane crossing. So anytime we have pedestrians uh, exposed uh, to multiple vehicle lanes for a long time, uh, so you may recognize this intersection as a, a DLT, displaced left turn, or a continuous flow intersection, where you have the, the left turns uh, kind of uh, that channelized crossing over. Um, and, and so you can take a multi-lane crossing and you can break it up into to multiple stages, thereby mitigating that flag. Um, and just the same for, you know, again, a small conventional intersection. Uh, you see here the northern crossing is probably relatively safe. Uh, the southern crossing is a little bit longer. Uh, but most of you, you know, uh, in the southeastern part of the United States, which, uh, which we're covering here with this conference, you, you generally know that we have many lar much larger intersections uh, that create a lot of exposure and potentially high speed to the pedestrian, thereby triggering that flag. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shannon to walk you through a case application uh, to see how this, how this may play out. Thanks, Fashion. So as part of this project, we were, or, or after this project completed, we were invited by Bike Delaware to uh, use this methodology on, on an intersection within Delaware. Um, and it was kind of at the, at the height of the pandemic in, in uh, November. And so we weren't able to visit in, in person, 
Um, but we were able to get some information from the local folks about this intersection and, and gather some information. So the intersection that we were looking at was Falkland Road and Center Road in Wilmington. Um, you can see there on the left, the kind of overview of Wilmington, our intersection is to the west of downtown, but on a, you know, some two fairly uh, major uh, arterials there, um, particularly the north-south arterial there is, is a kind of a ring arterial. Uh, and then on the right side is that zoomed in image of our intersection. You'll recognize it from that first slide that Bastion was showing you. So um, here's that part where he was saying to kind of form your own opinion, we're gonna, we're gonna give you our, our take on this intersection. So even though we weren't able to look at uh, the intersection in person, we were able to use a couple of different sources of information to kind of get some context about the intersection. So one of the, the, the key pieces we used was the Strava heat maps, and, and Strava is a great tool, um, but it does come with some, some side effects, right? So we do uh, like to use Strava to see what your pedestrian and bicycle activity looks like. It tends to skew towards your um, users who are exercising because it's a, it's a phone-based app. Lots of people use it to track their runs or their bikes. And so it can give you a sense of what the pedestrian and bicycle traffic looks like, but it's definitely not comprehensive of all user types. Um, but you can see here on the right, left side, we have our bicyclist activity. Um, and this site in particular, on the east side of our intersection, there is a trail. And you can see that in the, in the image here, kind of the, the bright white part of the image is heavy bicycle usage and the more red that color gets is lower bicycle usage and you can see on the bicycle map that actually there are some bicyclists heading north through the intersection that use the road uh, and others that are using that trail just to the right of the road uh, then on the on the but, but you can really see that our heavy traffic is east west headed down into wilmington itself and coming back out you know, suggesting a commuter pattern there. And that's where those marked bike lanes are. For the pedestrians there on the right, you can see um, a heavy northbound to eastbound movement. Um, if you were to look at kind of the zoomed out image here, you would see that we think that it's pretty much a, a, a neighborhood circulator walking path, more or less. Um, but it's important to see in that, uh, yep, in there, thanks, Bastion. So you can kind of see our, our intersection there circled in red. Um, and you can see the, again, the whiter that color is, the heavier the volumes, the bluer is lower volumes. We can see kind of a, a circular walking path there. Um, and then Bastion, if you go to the zoomed in picture as well, on that southwest quadrant is a shopping center and a gas station. So you can see uh, pedestrian movements east to west across that southern crosswalk. You also see some pedestrian movements north-south on the eastern side of the crosswalk. Um, on the northeastern quadrant, you have a DuPont manufacturing plant. And so, you know, there, there's some thoughts perhaps that it's um, people going to the shopping center for lunch or the trail continues for another quarter of a mile to the north of this intersection. So it could be folks using that trail as well. So looking then at the intersection here again is that zoomed in picture. You can see the on the southwest corner is the shopping center. The northern northeastern is the more uh, industrial. And then that southeastern quadrant is the, the residential. So you kind of have a little bit of everything here. Um, and you can see that the, the sidewalk usage here is indicative of what we were seeing from those pedestrian maps, right? On the, on the northwest quadrant, we kind of have this sidewalk to nowhere um, in both the westbound and northbound directions. And, and we did see you know, less pedestrian patterns there from the Strava heat map. So I wanna dive in and show you all kind of, we did a full analysis of this intersection with the 20 flags. We don't have time to give you the, the full rundown of every single flag, but as Bastian mentioned, um, every flag does come with a quantitative threshold for the red flag and the yellow flag, which I think is, is very helpful, right? Because it can create an, an objective process to analyze all intersections against each other. And so the first kind of, I, I want to walk through these red flags with you here. And the first one we saw were the motor vehicle right turns. So you have these fairly generous uh, high speed turns uh, where you have the, the pedestrian crossings to get onto that, that channelizing island. Uh, and so that exceeded our speed threshold of 20 miles per hour. Um, and, and it also exceeded um, probably the volume threshold of 50 vehicles 
Uh, and so that, that received a red flag there. The second red flag that we identified was crossing a yield controlled paths. So as Bastian mentioned, you look at the overview of this, you have these nice painted bike lanes, uh, really great crosswalks. The bike lanes are even striped across the yield controlled turning lanes. Uh, but that is, e even with the paint marking there, it still can be a danger to bicyclists. Um, that they are crossing that yield controlled movement. Um, just because of the speed differential between bicyclists and vehicles, uh, that could be a potential issue with vehicles not seeing and therefore not yielding to those bicyclists at that point. Multi-lane crossings were an issue for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, so there are median islands here in all four directions, but none of those extend out into the crosswalk to serve as refuge for uh, pedestrians. Uh, and so it is still a fairly lengthy, a lengthy crossing. You're looking at something, you know, 70 to 80 feet between those islands, probably, if not more. The intersecting driveways here. So that is a, a measure for the intersecting driveways. We're looking along the corridor within the intersections area of influence. Uh, and you have the shopping center as well as uh, the, the gas station. The gas station has three entrances there, um, but that that northern entrance for the gas station is actually, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see because of the, the tree cover, but that, uh, that, northern, that northern access can be accessed to the shopping center as well. So there's two accesses into the shopping center and another uh, two accesses that are exclusive to the, the gas station. So the number of, of, of intersecting driveways there can really create issues for pedestrians along those crosswalks as well as the bicyclists that are moving through, uh, making either making the eastbound to southbound right turn or just southbound bicyclists that are, are moving uh, past those southern driveways. The site distance is an interesting one to look at. We were uh, able to, to get down to some, some street view images to try and understand the, the interplay of the site distance for vehicles that are making a right turn and needing to yield to pedestrians. Uh, and it, it's really interesting. It's one of those common things you see where that, that line of trees uh, was probably really well uh, placed for site distance for vehicles uh, and, and was maybe an intentional decision there. But the site is actually causing some, some site distance issues for pedestrians, for vehicles moving at speed. So that pedestrian that's crossing into the intersection could be uh, blocked by those trees from any vehicle that's making the right hand turn. Riding in mixed traffic, so we do have marked bicycle lanes here, but when you look at the FHWA bikeway facility selection guide, the volumes and speeds on this road are a, a little bit higher than what you would really want for an on-street, non-buffered, non-separated bike lane. Uh, and so that, that still is a red flag there. Even though you do have an on-street painted bicycle facility, it's not really appropriate for the context of volumes and speeds at this intersection. Bicycle clearance time is an interesting one. Uh, and and the, this, this 20 flag methodology is meant to be able to be taken from the planning alternatives analysis side all the way through final design. But we did want to include some signal timing aspects. And so um, I won't get into details, but we gave some guidance on how to think about signal timing before your signal timing was actually set. Um, and one of those aspects was bicycle clearance times. So you are looking at a bicycle moving through this intersection, again, crossing um, probably you know, close to, if not uh, you know, 100 feet there. Uh, if you're going to have standard clearance times, that's probably not going to be long enough for a bicycle to clear the intersection before the opposing vehicle gets the green, um, given their travel speeds. And so that, that received a red flag there. The channelized lane or sorry the lane change across vehicle lanes here if a bike very simple if a bicyclist wants to make a left turn they're going to be merging across a number of lanes that received a red flag uh, and then the channelized lanes so uh, for a bicyclist who wants to make a right turn they would need to turn through those channelized lanes and from some of the focus groups groups that we conducted for the 725 project um, we just you know, heard again and again that this was a very uncomfortable position for those bicyclists to be in in those channelized lanes, whether that's with standard vehicles or with vehicles that could be off tracking into um, the, the bicyclist path. So we did then 
go through and do the full analysis. I won't spend too much time here because these numbers uh, don't mean a lot by themselves, right? There's a good chance to see what are the, where are your flags. Um, but we wanted to try and see, could we take this intersection and do two versions of a redesign? One with um, some real simple, uh small projects and a second that would be like a full intersection redesign and so we're going to show you those assessments now and then we'll show you uh or show you those two changes now and then we'll walk through the assessment of all three intersections at the end so in this first assessment we are looking at low cost easily imp implementable strategies we've widened those uh cut throughs on the island to make the the space available to pedestrians on those islands a little bit more comfortable. The second piece we worked on was installing raised crosswalks. So Bastian mentioned this in one of the examples from earlier in the presentation, but those raised crosswalks lower the turning volume, the turning vehicle speed. And because that speed is reduced then below 20 miles per hour, that reduces or eliminates our, our uh, right turning conflict flag. The third piece was to strike the bike, bike lane through the intersection and provide that visual delineation all the way through the intersection. So that uh, that helped with, even though bike lanes aren't necessarily the preferred option here, that does provide a little bit more protection to those bicyclists. We then added two stage left turn boxes as well so that bicyclists didn't need to make the um, four lane merge across traffic for a left turn. We also consolidated driveway access. So as I mentioned, that uh, northern, the second northern driveway is access both to the um, gas station and to the shopping center. So we closed the northern shopping center access and the southernmost um, gas station access point. The sixth idea was to build the driveway islands at the remaining driveways that existed um, to provide an opportunity for pedestrians to be in that refuge and be a little bit more seen by the vehicles, but also to slow down the volume of, or to slow down the speeds of vehicles turning in and out of those driveways. The seventh point then was to install stop signs and channelized turn lanes. Again, this one might be a little bit harder to uh, convince folks of than others, um, but but we had the, the luxury of getting to throw out ideas and uh, uh, have, have some some flexibility in our thoughts, but that would help those bicyclists that are coming through the yield controlled movements if they're stop controlled. And then the last idea was to raise refuge islands and extend the noses of those islands out into the crosswalks so that pedestrians have some refuge and don't need to cross as many lanes um, on their own. Now, all of these were just ideas. Uh, we weren't able to work with Bike Delaware or the city of Wilmington to really further explore these ideas or, or how they may work in the, in the context of the intersection. But these were some initial thoughts of ways that we could address this intersection with low cost strategies and reduce those conflicts or, or flags. The second assessment then, uh, and you can see here that we've actually reduced all red flags for the pedestrians. And we have, uh, or we've eliminated all red flags, reduced the number of yellow flags. Our bicycle score, not as great, um, but still some benefits there. There are other flags that we were able to mitigate but not completely eliminate um, that, that had benefits as well. The second assessment then was to uh, create a, a new design, right? And so we, we thought of using the median U-turn design to provide uh, some additional benefits to pedestrians and bicyclists. This one had a lot more benefits for bicyclists, um, but you can see some of the same ideas were, were used here. We took away those channelized right turns and pulled them into the intersection for direct rights. Um, we continued the striped bicycle lanes through the intersection. We still have some of those dividers on the driveway. So similar ideas, but a full intersection redesign. You can see on the left side of the image as well, we've provided some mid-block crossings for uh, those pedestrians at the neighborhood access uh, and, and uh, also created additional opportunities for um, vehicles to turn left and right out of the shopping center uh, at that most northwestern crossing there. Uh, so the scores then on this assessment, uh, uh, alternative two, 
The really interesting piece that I like to point out here on the left, you can see our pedestrian assessments stacked across. And on the right, we have our bicycle assessments. And one thing that we found in 725 is that one, there is no perfect intersection, right? Like, I think it will be a challenge to find an intersection that has zero flags whatsoever. And the second is that when you're comparing these alternatives, you often can find that one alternative may be better for pedestrians and another may be better for bicycles. And this is exactly the case we see, right? Alternative one looks great for pedestrians, not so great for bicyclists, but, uh, but alternative two does a lot better for bicyclists. And so there's still a lot of um, need for engineering judgment for knowledge of the surrounding con context of the intersection and what the community prioritizes um, because it's not as simple as just picking the quote unquote best option. So, uh, and again, here, just taking this back to the performance based design process, uh, we really intend for this methodology to be used not only during alternatives analysis, but being carried all the way through final design. Um, when you're working with your signal folks and looking at where are you going to place things, don't just think about pedestrians and bicyclists at the end. Um, bring them in early uh, because once you've gotten that, you know, 75% plan set, uh, it's, it's really hard to just kind of shoehorn pedestrians and bicyclists in, right? And so um, by using this process from alternatives analysis all the way through, you can really iterate on those uh, decision uh, points uh, in step four here of the, of the process and use the quantitative methodology to help you evaluate what sort of improvements you've made and what additional items of concern you need to address on the next go round. So with that, we will uh, turn it back over to you, Sean. All right. Thank you, guys. That was that was great. I think you said it, you know, the, the, the opening slide showing the the intersection. It's almost like at first glance, you think, oh, that looks like a very, I mean, it looks very well striped. Yeah, I, I mean, the, I would love some crosswalks like that near where, where I live. I mean, yeah, it's it's a big intersection, but it doesn't look too bad. Um, but really drilling down on these things really does show that that even some of the littlest things can, can, can add up and create discomfort, you know, at best, or like you said, at worst, some safety concerns. So really really cool um I, I actually had a question I, I you might have mentioned this bastion but i just want to get a little bit more clarity so on the 20 um on the design flags um you know some of them seem to be a mixture of of quantitative and qualitative so you i, I believe you all mentioned that you you did have some um, focus groups with bicycle groups to kind of not only the empirical ones but more of the ones that are comfort based or whatever you said okay yeah so the so the actual project so we did four focus groups that were specific to some of the alternative designs. Uh, and so we had the focus groups in locations where those designs were prevalent. We actually did our cuts in North Carolina, but then we did um, uh, DDIs in, I'm trying to remember now, in Missouri and leading U-turns in Detroit and then the continuous flow in, in Utah and Salt Lake City. Because we wanted to talk to cyclists and pedestrians who had actually traveled through them, right? So. Um, and yeah, and then so we did that, and we also combined it with kind of an expert survey um, that actually some of you may have participated in. We got uh, close to 50,000 comments. No, no, wait, I'm, I'm getting that number wrong. 5,000 comments? I don't know, a lot of comments. Um, uh, individual comments on on these various designs. I tried to bring all those. Very cool. All right, we have a couple questions coming in. Um, so one is. Was traffic delay and restrictions to turning radii, uh, has that been investigated with these multimodal adjustments? And will there be a speed reduction due to the pedestrian refuge island? I would hope so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speed reduction is the number one thing you can do for pedestrians, right? Um, and for cyclists. And then and reducing the speed differential, and if you're familiar with kind of the, the safe systems literature, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean that every intersection should be designed for 10 miles per hour speed, right? So it's, it's all about intersection context. Um, but, but it is really important to just call a spade a spade when it comes to if you have a 45 mile per hour speed limit roadway and you put a crosswalk and you put an RFB, for example, 
drivers will not yield. The compliance to that device will be zero. Um, and that's been documented in research and it, it's just understandable, right? So if you're going 45 miles per hour, are you going to slam on the brakes to stop for a pedestrian and, and get risk of rear-ended? So, so speed is a big deterrent for drivers to yield. And so that, again, it doesn't mean that every intersection is mile per hour, but it's just important to recognize that if you're designing for 45, um, uh, drivers will not slow down. Um, and I think you can test yourself, right? Get to a crosswalk and see if you would slow down. Um, so, so to me, and that's important, so I went back to this one, right? Every design will have different outcomes, right? A, a freeway interchange in, you know, in Missouri with 20% trucks or 30% trucks has a certain design purpose and certain design goals. Um, and a, an urban intersection in downtown Wilmington has a very different purpose. So keeping that in mind, keeping context in mind, um, all indications are that Green Book 8 is going to go that direction, right? So a context-based design process where we're looking not just at, at urban and rural, but we're looking at the context of where the intersection is, the users that intersection serves. And then, yes, there will be cases where we're making decisions for pedestrian and bicyclist safety that will result in speed reductions for vehicles. And I would consider that a good outcome in a downtown environment. Great. Uh, another question related to, was there a traffic analysis performed for the pedestrian and cyclist counts? Oh, Shan, you're muted. Oh, okay, sorry. For, for this intersection specifically, we did not have traffic counts for pedestrians and bicyclists. Uh, and the, the thought behind where this comes into play at alternatives assessment is you may or may not have those volumes there. Um, the assessment, it's the, the quantitative basis of the assessment doesn't require pedestrian volumes. You need to have a general sense of vehicle volumes. Generally, do you have more or fewer than 50 uh, vehicles making a right-hand turn? Do you have more or fewer than 7,000 vehicles per day. So we tried to make it uh, accessible for intersections where you don't necessarily have a full turning movement count analysis. Okay, great. Um, well, I know we're, we're over time, uh, but been some really great questions and some awesome presentations. Um, I, I went ahead and posted the email addresses in the chat uh, so you can you can email the presenters if you have some pertinent questions that you want to talk to them uh, uh, right away, as well as the present. Be on the lookout for the presentations and, and, a, and a video of this um, of this entire session. Um, and with that, I think we're going to come to a close. And thank you so much to to all the presenters. Um, this has been a great session, and uh, we'll see everybody uh, hopefully hopefully next year in Kentucky. We'll all be together, and we'll be back in Wilmington a few years after that. So. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everybody.